I've spent a lot of time for many years talking about testing and even developing for various augmented and virtual reality platforms and tools. I've built HoloLens custom AR apps and HoloLens guides. I've modeled objects and office environments in Blender and Unity and published them to Altspace VR. I've even spent about 50 hours in Skyrim VR, so serious credentials. That said, Metaverse is a very hot topic right now at the top of the hype curve. This past week at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the Metaverse was a key discussion point and the WEF claims to be defining and building the Metaverse. I think that's getting ahead of things just a bit, so I called up this friend of mine. This is an evolution of the internet that then gives us the notion of internet of place. How do we create spaces that span sort of virtual and physical and, and the experience between those two? And then it is the notion of looking at ownership as a part of that. That's Aaron Reich, the Managing Director of Emerging Technology and Ventures at Avanad. In the next hour, you'll hear us talk about our definitions of metaverse, the core technologies, platforms, and companies out front and what we should do about it now. Let's get into it. This is Unevenly Distributed, a podcast from nextdevice.com, where we talk to experts to find out what's next in digital technology and where it's real today. Here's your host, Jeff Villamec. Aaron, hello. Hey Jeff, how are you? Welcome to a Metaverse Discussion. And the place I thought we should probably start is what is a metaverse, the metaverse? Where are all these terms at today? I want to get your thoughts on it. I have some of my thoughts on it. So why don't, why don't you kick it off there and we'll see where we go on what is the metaverse? Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> there's sort of the original definition of, of, of the metaverse. And I think it has spawned into everybody sort of making their own sort of view of, hey, it's very narrowly focused and it is VR, or it's very widely focused and could almost be anything that you want in terms of a new experience. You know, what I look at is driving a lot of the energy around all of this today is just the notion of we've got through 20 years of the evolution or plus that of, of the internet. And now we're talking about that next evolution of the internet. And in there, I think there are two differences that we are seeing. One of that is that this is an evolution of the internet that then gives us the aspect of like the notion of internet of place. Like how do we create spaces that span sort of virtual and physical and, and the experience between those two? And then it is the notion of looking at ownership as a part of that. So can the way that I start to use the internet have a different way that I am exchanging value than the way I've been doing that today? Um, and I think when we look at this idea of that there's something that is coming that is changing the way that we have our experiences and that there are different places we do that and different ways that we are exchanging value, it is still a pretty broad definition, but I see that as sort of yep. the underpinnings of what we're really talking about here. I think a couple things there, the broad definitions and the, the definitions of repurposing the word metaverse for whatever anyone wants to make it when they're <laughs> right. pitching their ideas or writing articles about it or whatever, that's continuing to pl proliferate. And we're going to see that continue to, in a somewhat unfortunate way, devalue the idea of what metaverse is or confuse the idea of what metaverse is, yep. which is fine. I've come to the conclusion that I just need to embrace that. And <laughs> yeah. we as technologists are going to need to chart a path through where all of that is at. One of the key definitions, though, so there have been experiments in metaverse kinds of things for decades. So the, the term, for as sure. you suggest, came out in the early 90s when Neil Stevenson yep. in Snow Crash started using it. That was one of the key places that it was sort of invented or popularized. And way back then, even then, the idea of virtual reality, 3D renderings, 3D spaces was even part of the initial versions of the internet. Yeah. VRML being a piece of that. That was, we we're going we're to have HTML and we were going to have VRML mm -hmm. and it was going to be vectors and 3D spaces and 3D objects. It didn't have all of the connection to what you're suggesting now, the mapping to the real world, yeah. which I think is a really interesting component we'll get into. So it's been around. 
and it's been experimented with. And these spaces have been experimented with the, the virtual spaces. I think where we're at right now is there's a few different sets of technology that are evolving that are going to come together and enhance what's possible. So we're certainly going to talk about technology here in just a minute. Yeah. Um, but one of the other things that I think is key that I th is kind of confused right now is opened versus closed, walled garden versus the idea of a metaverse versus the metaverse. What I would hope, and this is the direction I would love to see things go, but I don't think it's going to, is the, meta the metaverse to be an open, interconnected interchange of all of these technologies that allow us to have experiences which cross boundaries, yeah. which cross boundaries between band, brands and platforms and implementations and technologies. What I expect is that each of the major players and small players and startups is going to be creating a metaverse and they're going to want to own the platform. They're going to want to be the oasis. They're going to want to be Second Life or the street from Snow Crash. And in that, we're going to get a lot of interesting experimentation and implementations, but it's going to be very segmented. It's going to be a bunch of silos and we're going to need some bold thinking and some bold leadership by some of the leaders. And we'll get into who some of those players are as well to try to open that up and break down those boundaries and create some interchange between the way experiences could cross across them and, and cross those boundaries. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Do you agree? I mean, so we're definitely in the phase of the way the world works today, which is there are, for lack of a better term, sort of centralized or controlled platforms. There's a view that that we have, which is actually going to be a little bit of a step change to what has been happening. So let, let's not use metaverse as an example. Let's go back to 40, 50 years in the past, right? There was mainframe, right? And you can think of mainframe really as, you know, sort of centralized in some way. And then we move to you know, client server, which was a bit more distributed and decentralized in the way that systems talk to each other and the way that they worked. You could argue, I, I argue, I don't know if anyone else sort of agrees, but I think of, you know, the age that we're sort of in at the moment is sort of this mobile computing age. And we're sort of back a little bit in that centralized you know, I'm going through mm -hmm. platforms and the, what I need to, the platforms don't do a great job of interoperating with each other. Some of them are better than others, but really there's, you know, I'm going one place and that's where I'm getting my stuff. Yep. We were talking about a little bit of the definition of the metaverse. I think, you know, something that's super interesting, that's if, if we look at some macro trends that are just sort of happening at the moment, some of this stuff has been around for a while. You know, you talked about the RML, right? Like there's ways that, you know, a lot of these concepts, I think you mentioned Second Life as well. Like this stuff is not necessarily new. What's different though, is you've got just way more computing power, which is cheaper than you've ever mm -hmm. had it sort of before. If you look at actually what happened, you know, and is continuing to happen as we're going through the pandemic, you've had this, compression of adoption of technology that actually has brought a little bit more savviness across multiple generations right so it's like i look at through the heart yeah. yeah like through the heart of the pandemic like my dad they used to go with a group of people every saturday morning to the coffee shop and that was the thing that they did and they quickly rotated that and every saturday and then tuesday evening they moved that to a zoom meeting right and that was not something they were familiar or comfortable with before, but now it's sort of almost a little like second hat. Like, you know, they much prefer the in-person one than that, but that like that notion of adoption, they're much more comfortable with. And so I think this idea of maybe I need some other set of equipment or there's something new that's here, there's a little bit more of a willingness to kind of lean in and go, hmm, this is interesting and it's not so foreign to me. Um, as maybe before, I was just a little bit more removed from that. Um, and then I think the other thing is a lot of the technologies are not siloed, right? Like it is not just sort of cloud computing or mobile computing. It is a combination of data and artificial intelligence and vision and like all of these things then are able to come together 
that you didn't really have before. Um, right. And so as we look at that, you know, I believe, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, from, from the Avenant side too, that, that we're really looking at and leaning into is I don't, we don't think that there's going to be a, a, a seesaw, so to speak, of going from centralized to everything is going to be decentralized like we had in those previous incarnations. We think that organizations are going, we're going to be living in a world where both of these things are going to coexist. So as an organization, I'm going to choose and I'm going to have certain experiences that will make sense in some sort of centralized and controlled fashion. And that's the way that we want to do it. And there's going to be other things that we're going to do and build that will be part of decentralized types of systems. Um, will those be able to interact in some way? I think we've got to see who's, as you said, going to step up, be bold enough, want to try some things and really lean in. I think the biggest onus on some of this actually falls to what's going to be the demand that the consumer or the employee sort of puts here where they want sort of central ownership of some of these things. Because part of that interoperability of the, is of the content of the, the con- things that they create within of the, there. Yeah. Of the content of the, you know, the things that are mine. If I'm trying to exchange value, I'd hate to be right. on a meta platform and only be able to use a currency there, which then if I'm in a Microsoft platform is a different one. If I eventually am in an Apple one, yeah. is a different like it makes it really hard then to go, well, you know, I'm just gonna choose sort of one horse and that's sort of the place I'm always gonna ride. Um, and, and that may save us what companies and brands and consumers are going to demand of what they can bring yep. with them to each of the metaverse silos that might spring up yep. that, that may save us and, and may force some of the big players to break down some of those walls. Yeah. And I haven't done enough research, so I couldn't tell you if anything is happening sort of in this area, but I look at some signals and I just go, Let's look at the last five years alone of what's happened in the AI space, where there are some standards that 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 organizations want to create, especially on some of the open source platforms, and that they have come together. And you've got Amazon and Meta and Google and Apple and Microsoft, plus a bunch of other just large corporations that all come together and go, we need this stuff to work a little bit better. And so we're going to figure out what that actually means. And I think that that gives me hope that this next iteration, there's going to be more of that type of collaboration in the areas where the intersections need to happen. Right. Two, two things. I think the opportunity for us to demand the, as, as businesses and consumers yeah. for that collaboration to happen is going to be helpful. And then as you started to allude to, and I think what we can dig into a little bit more is the evolution of where a bunch of these technologies are coming together and what specifically those technologies are today is also potentially going to be something that will save us to some degree. There will be components of the technology and the platforms and these new tools that are available that will make it easier to cross the boundaries. And so when we make those demands of Facebook, Meta, that we need to be able to come in and out of their walled garden, the tools are there so that they don't have to reinvent something brand new. Yeah. But I also think there's, look, I, I love technology and I mean, that's what I'm in every day as part of looking at the emerging tech side of things. That's not going to be the savior that's going to be here. Right. Like we could, there, 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 there's belief that we could build systems and that they will have sort of trust inherently baked into them. Like, all of these things, but at the end of the day, we are all humans. There are all things and ways that we interact and want to interact with others. And I think sometimes that human element gets left out of the equation. And when we're talking about, you know, whatever your definition is going to be of metaverse types of experiences, they can't all be technology driven. There's such a big sort of people component that's a driver of some of the change that needs to happen, but also just a driver of What's something that's better? Like, I still go back to sort of the really simple example that I like to use, which is, you know, 12 years ago, Steve Jobs came on stage and announced the launch of the iPad. You then had two or three years after that, companies beginning, you you saw those start to show up 
in retail stores and you would have, you know, a, a, a store associate walk around with a tablet being able to, you know, not necessarily a better interaction form, but just the way to like, hey, I want to show you this product in a little bit different way. Whereas now you can walk into any retail store and there's a ton of tablets and you've got store associates that can now do everything from checking you out, not at a cash register, but exactly where you're standing with whatever the item is or the items that, that you've chosen. And that is a shift of experiences. It may not be in this right. crazy VR way that right. we've been thinking about it, but there's a step change that has been there. And this will be a step change in that in that same way. I'm with you there. So the, the technology enabling and empowering us being able to have that human experience in more interesting and in ways. I yeah. I'm I'm there. In fact, looking at my list of core technologies that I think are sort of required to think about metaverse. One of the key ones is just the straight up collaboration tools, chat and voice and yeah. video and, you know, Zoom and Teams and that kind of interaction, collaboration, talk, we want to talk to each other. Those tools have come a long way. Yep. And that kind of communication and collaboration between people, that has to be central to the system because that's going to be one of the core experiences. You don't want to be yep. in the metaverse by yourself. The point is to both interact with the virtual world, the, the physical world, and then other people, yeah. probably primarily other people. And that's yeah. where a lot of like for well, us, and worlds and great, space VR is all at today. I, I do think there's a general sense of people want to get together in person. I do think that there's a ton that people want to get together in, in you know, some sort of virtual world as well. You can see that from things that we've done or other companies too, of where, you know, I've got a common meeting space. And, you know, I'm based in Seattle. I got part of my team that's in London. You know, it's sometimes nice if you're in a virtual space to be able to come together and interact in a way where maybe there's someone that's in Germany that just walks up to the virtual coffee bar that we've got, right? Like, it's just right. some things that you get, again, that notion of place and, 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 and sort of zeroing that out a little bit and going, Hey, that's not a, you know, Zoom or a Teams meeting where I'm inviting someone to be. There's a place where somebody else is hanging out, just like I was sort of in an office, and they can walk up and we can have a conversation. And there are really interesting, good benefits to some of those things that are a little hard to quantify, maybe, but it's a, it does make a little bit of of a difference, and it and and people yeah. enjoy doing those things. It's a gap in this acceleration of transition of business models and working models in the yeah. past couple of years. I've been talking to a bunch of companies lately that are going full virtual. Their, mm -hmm. their entire staff and their working model is virtual. And one of the things that they will talk about is there are some gaps that are hard to fill, which is that sense of place yeah. and that opportunity for the casual interaction. So there's, there's opportunities there. Back on the point of the technology and I'm interested because it seemed like you were downplaying it to, to some degree or, or not as optimistic, but the technology to enable us to create the devices or the, not, not the devices, but the, but the objects and the currency and the content and cross boundaries, the adjacent technologies, I think is a, is a place that we can dig in for, for just a sec. So the core technologies, VR, we get that augmented reality. I think yeah. we want to get into that too, because that might be something people aren't thinking about as much for metaverse collaboration, commerce, 3D rendering engines, all of that. The adjacent technologies like blockchain and NFTs and Web 3.0 and what's going to live on edge computing and what is AI going to do for us. Let's, let's break into some of those and blockchain and NFTs to start because that is one that people are hoping and a lot of these startups that are playing in metaverse or calling themselves metaverse are focusing on because they think they can make money off of it. Um, a lot of people are hoping that that is going to be one of those technologies that allow us to create an asset or a bit of content or a representation of ourselves and then use that to cross boundaries between walled gardens or implementations or experiences. Now, you seem to be saying that that's is, I mean, are, do you agree that, I, I, I bet you agree that's possible, but is it a little sure. bit of a pipe dream? Is it not really going to manifest in the way that we expect? Where, where are you thinking there? So if we compare kind of blockchain and NFT, right? I think of them, while they are related, a little separate. So I think yep. of blockchain truly as there's 
the sort of inf core infrastructure that needs to be in place. And the NFT can be in a simple term, like an app that's running on top of that infrastructure. And I think we go through these cycles of what's the infrastructure that we need and how does that advance? And then also what is the app cycle and how does that advance? And they flip flop with each other of kind of where adoption is at. There's a strong desire for changing and rethinking how value is exchanged in the in in you know just in in any sense. So that could be asset, it could be monetary, what what whatever that may be. And I think that NFTs are not that they're going to be going away in any sense, but I I, I think it's really interesting experimentation. Um, there are people that yeah. are making money today, which is totally fair and valid. There's a lot of skeptics that are out there today. When anything is new, you're going to have both of those parties. Right. And I think it's the early evolution of something that will be. I don't know what that will be, but there is the, the notion yeah. of us being able to have a different mechanism to, for lack of a better term, pay or exchange for something is going to be a key piece of this no matter what. Is it based on blockchain underneath? Is it based on something else? That to be determined. But the notion sure. of what the app is sure. doing is 100% needed. Um, and, you know, will it be something that's more traditional? Will it be something that's new? I, I think it's going to be a little bit of blend of the both. 12 to 18 months from now and sort of looking at what the what has happened with the evolution of NFTs, I think it's going to be really interesting to sort of see what that looks like. I think it's also going to be interesting to see, I agree. especially a lot of this stuff has been happening through a roaring global economy. If things do slow down, and they most likely will, what does that mean for this notion of value exchange? Um, we're seeing some of that in the crypto markets today. Um, that doesn't, but that sure. doesn't, I, I'm not a, I, I don't believe that that's the bottom in the end of the crypto. Like it's just, it's a market it's going to do, and it's going to ebb and flow. It's going to tamp down on the irrational exuberance over the idea that there yeah. is inherent value in some of these things, like some of these crypto coins and NFTs, because yeah. there's not inherent value. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm one of the skeptics and, there, but to your point, the te underlying technology and the ideas that the technology represent represents, which is what what blockchain and what NFTs is a non fungible, tradable, yeah. encrypted, trusted token represents, those will persist. Yeah. And because well, we're getting more comfortable with them as implementators and the businesses that are building these technologies, it doesn't have to be that in the future. Correct. So what, what you were suggesting. It doesn't yeah. have to be blockchain and NFT, but we can take that idea of a non-fungible yep. object, virtual object, and implement it some other way, but use that then as the vehicle to take my digital twin or my virtual object and move it from place to place to place. Yeah, Eventually. I mean, look at the beginning of, just, just look at the history of like YouTube, if you wanna use that as a really big example of the beginning of video on the internet. I mean, there's multiple other examples to choose, but like, if I, my memory serves me right, I mean, I think YouTube really started as almost a video dating service in some way that then evolved. Then you had a mix of yeah. Justin TV coming into that as well, where a guy had a camera and was, you know, you could follow him of every, he was recording everything in his life. Like that, I look at that as a parallel of what is sort of happening. Like I'm ignoring the underlying infrastructure there, but the notion of there's something really, in, there's at that time it was, how do we get video? Because video is going to be an interesting medium in this new interaction layer that we have. Now we're talking right. about a new level of exchange of value that needs to be in the same interaction level. And so we're in that same early state of, you know, this will evolve. It is not going away. It ha it, it's going to be core to what this is. We just, you know, there's a lot of experiments that are going on to kind of see what, what works and some some are, and in a year, they probably won't be here, and others will, you know, that'll spawn other things. Yep. One other set of technologies before we move off of it that I did want to experiment with virtually with you right now is <laughs> we get, and I think everybody, when they think of the metaverse, they think of the pictures that they've seen, Ready Player One and, right, and yeah, Snow yeah, Crash, sure. and it's a virtual reality experience, and then I can do, I can have, I can talk to people, I can interact with objects, and and that is interesting and fine and fun. 
there's another angle to it where there are new technologies available in the last few years in particular, maybe the last five, six, of augmented reality and overlaying both virtual place into physical and bringing physical into the virtual and that yep. interaction between them that can be, it, I don't think there's a lot of it just yet, but it can be a component of metaverse and what we think of as oh, these various metaverse sure. implementations. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big believer in augmented reality. And I would, uh, I would put that under my definition business, of metaverse. I think in order for it to be successful long-term, I think it has to be as well. Yeah, I mean, and think of the notion of, I don't know if we need to define it for the group that's listening here, but like the notion of a spatial anchor, right? It's like, I'm going to go plot yeah. something in a virtual world, but in a physical location that other people are going to be able to interact with. To, to link those. To link them. To link, I, link the virtual with the physical. Exactly. So that potentially if I'm in the physical and I've got some advanced device that maybe doesn't even exist yet, where I've yep. got a set of Ray-Bans that yeah. allow me to see the overlay. And there's... Yep. We'll, we'll show off versions of this that are getting closer. HoloLens is there, but it's now nobody's going to wear that all day. Yeah, but like I could get a notification on my watch, right? It doesn't have to be a headset yeah. or in some way. Or Yeah, or my right. phone buzzes and says, hey, 100%. you hit in the real world yep. a virtual anchor yep. that maps an augmented reality experience into that virtual world. Microsoft has done some work in there. They've got some videos that maybe we could sh show off that show some of these experiments. But in the simplest forms, some of that already exists. You could There's pieces of things built into Google Maps where I can hold up my phone in well, an augmented I, reality type of view in a city and get some virtual information overlaid on the physical world, connect some of those anchors together and get a meta experience in the physical. Niantic, right? Who had the original kind of Pokemon yes. Go. I saw and I didn't read it close enough but it caught my eye enough that I, I believe that they just bought a company or investing in something eighth wall yeah that's exactly right so i think you're starting to see some of those signals right like you yes can, you can begin to see that the, like the, the the ship is moving in that direction right and again we we don't know what it's going to be but i think that it to me that's a little bit more of a tangible space so i i also like the vr i think there's a a, a time and space for that and use cases that are relevant um, and deliver value for any type of organization at, at, at that right use case. But I, I always like the moniker of something needs to be like 10 times easier before it really gets adopted by everybody. And yes, the headset VR interaction component is just not there yet. I think it will get there. It's not. Somebody will. And it's not the best problem. experience for some of these interactions. Yeah. For, well, and you, for you and I to talk and have a conversation, a, a video screen, a, a video call where you and I can just sit yep. here and talk, uh, as opposed to an avatar, which degrades the level of communication that a video of me looking at your face yeah. can get today, may not in the future. And we may be able to get full facial mapping and, and the, that, that kind of experience. And we may, it may get better, but it's not there yet. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I think the yeah. the angle that this brings. So, if I put on a non-consumer sort of hat and I put on a pure, I'm an employee in an organization and experiences that we're trying to, you know, create or enhance in some way. There's a big part of this with, especially on the VR side, that has a psychological component that has not been figured out yet, right? Like let's say you do hop into one of these virtual meetings and you do have access to a headset and let's say you're in there for an hour and a half or a two hour meeting. Like there's a decompression that sort of sometimes also has to happen when you take that headset off and you're kind of coming back into the real world that you're in. Like there's all these things that yeah. we don't know that also have to be thought about of what that means. You can't context switch maybe as, as quickly. And then there's also an area that I think is super interesting from a psychological perspective of what's it going to play out as if organizations decide to let their own employees create avatars of themselves that then can be represented in employee only environments that am I going to represent myself as I would yeah, as you see me on video? Am I going to make myself a, am I going to plump myself up a little bit in an in Instagram type of way and have my, you know, everything's a little bit rosier, a little bit sexier, a little bit nicer. 
Um, am I going to show a different part of my personality that maybe you haven't seen at work, mm. which then plays into, cause you know, a lot of organizations today, whatever kind of collaboration platform they're using, right. You've got a profile photo that you have uploaded, but there's a yep. almost a little bit level of some professionalism that most people sort of put there, right? Like they may have cropped themselves out be. of some other photo, but you know, and there are people that do little things that are a little wackier, but for the majority you go, most are sort of standard sort of corporate photo of corporate appropriate photos. Does that apply to a representation of me as an avatar of what I want to do for my organization? Especially if maybe in my real life, do I then have a different avatar that I'm representing externally in a, in my sort of personal consumer? Are those the same? Um, and so ah. that whole psychological piece, I think, we're just at the beginning of trying to write rules, figure out, test, see what people do. Um, I mean, we're only 15 years in the social media experiment and we kind of know what has played out there. This is the opportunity to go, are we going to keep playing out that same narrative? Does the narrative change? It sounds like you're suggesting, and I kind of agree, that there's probably going to need to be a complete new discipline within human resources within HR 100%, 100%. that's going to need to sort of ideate around the governance of how we interact with and represent ourselves in these virtual environments. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Well, I completely agree because it's not just how you represent yourself and what you show, yeah. but it's also the objects that you bring into that space. The that content you, moderation, like, you know, the, the behavior interaction that's between there. virtual avatars, yeah. you know, there's, yeah. Very, there's, there's some very complex issues. Somebody that doing start something that maybe they didn't mean to, but inappropriate, like, right. you know, in the space. And what is and appropriate and inappropriate for 100%. virtual avatars that yeah. it, is it the same? There's already some somewhat sensational, but articles and headlines about inappropriate internet interaction on a couple of these on, virtual on the environment platforms, platforms for sure. Yeah. That, that are troubling, but are a great opportunity to upfront to be thinking about that and, and get ahead of it. Yep. A hundred percent agree. On the, the difference between our personal lives and getting into a virtual environment and the right place for a virtual environment versus the augmented reality, just to circle back on that yeah. for a second, uh, as you suggested, especially for work and what we do for business, so much of a lot of people's work includes a physical place, mm -hmm. manufacturing and healthcare and yeah. retail and, that physical place needs to be a component, but there's a lot of hybrid work going on in hybrid teams, augmented reality and bringing the augmented metaverse into a physical place with anchors and that idea of even social interaction. If we all have the, a view into the augmented metaverse overlaid on our physical, I think that can enable a whole bunch of experiences that you, we're not going to want to have a headset, a virtual re reality headset on all right. day. And it will, though, enable the people that are remote and can't get into the physical space where we are to participate and become part of it. Yeah. And that's, I think, just more another scenario where we can think about augmented reality as a component of metaverse or central to metaverse being a really compelling case where you are getting 10 times. It's not 10 times, it's almost infinite times because that, that person couldn't be there and they can't walk around the plant yep. yeah. with you physically. Yeah. So it and does think, en enable that. Again, we sort of snap right to, there's gotta be a headset or a different set of equipment that maybe I am using in some way. I think one of the yep. core underlying technologies that is going to be there supporting whatever the metaverse types of experiences are that will be created over time is a form of artificial intelligence. And the notion okay. of creating environments um, and doing some of that on the fly. So, you know, if, if we talk about that, we're going to go create a virtual world that will, re that requires me taking a bunch of 3d assets or hand crafting an office space, a world, loading objects into it, you know, not yep, super heavy lift, this. but yeah, but, but a heavy enough lift. But yes. what if, you know, and I know you well enough to be able to go, you have a proclivity of really enjoying kind of playing with different ways to do video and camera and intermixing that with green screens and the like. 
there are, and again, this is a taking the long definition of metaverse, ways with a simple camera, you and I could have a different interaction. Let's say you're a store so let's say you're a store associate and I'm shopping for something. We could be in an environment like you're sort of recording right now on on video. And you might be able to automatically change your background and make me actually feel like I'm a little bit inside the store. And some of that's auto AI generated. You're changing some camera angles. You're letting me pick, you're picking up a product. I can actually see, I can click some buttons and that product changes, you know, its shape, color, whatever it may be. And I'm able to do that interaction and experience. And I feel like I've changed my place a little bit. I may be able to buy that from you, which then has that value and ownership side of it. But I'm doing that without a headset. Maybe I'm doing that in an enhanced Zoom Teams new platform type of way that we're doing it that then is an early incarnation of what may to come. But I don't have some headset that I'm putting on to make it happen. I agree. I think that ability for those advanced machine learning models, and it's going to be multiple machine learning models that are put together to create some of these kinds of things you know, both some of the visual and the cognitive cognitive with the modeling and the creation of, of assets. Yeah. Google has the experiment that you can see right now where you can ask it to, to show you a puppy. Now show me a puppy with a hat and it creates that mm. image yeah. on the fly. Yeah, yeah. So stitching those together to both context sensitive, rearrange the environment to mm-hmm. make it a better experience for both of us, I think is really, really interesting. On the other side of when we're just creating from scratch, the full representation of either a physical space or a virtual environment that we want to create for the AI to help with that. Because as you said, and I've created these environments, I created it in Altspace, I created in Unity, I did some rendering in Blender of physical spaces. It's a lot of work. And you have studios and teams of people that do like laser mapping of physical spaces to create that. If an AI and a stereo camera on a set of sunglasses, you could look around a room and that helps sort of render that environment for you dynamically and quickly, that's going to transform what we're able to do in some of those ways as well. Yeah. And I mean, the thing that'll make this super easy for everybody at some point is I'm going to be able to take my phone and I'm going to be able to shoot a piece of video of a room that I'm in. And all of that automatically gets recognized as 3D objects that I can manipulate and load into some world. Now, yes. The scary part of that then also becomes, especially as we start talking about some of this synthetic data or AI generation of backgrounds and places and things like that. What is real? Who do I trust? Is that okay? What does that mean? So it also begs a lot of these early kind of questions that maybe 20 years ago weren't sort of really thought through that, you know, our view is you, you, you do now need to think through all of those aspects before you just go build. I, w- I would say think through them while building, because oh, what I don't want to sure. do yes, is yes, 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 yes. get ourselves into a situation where we're not even experimenting or we're limiting ourselves or we're, we're standing back. Yes. There's, yep. It's very easy to go to the ultimate sci-fi doomsday <laughs> scenario in our heads as a society when yeah, we yeah. think about anything, especially with AI. Yep. Uh, we, we think about the paperclip problem, which is an AI which is designed to make paperclips suddenly consumes all the resources on the entire planet and kills all humans <laughs> just so that it can make more paperclips right. uh, because that's what it was designed to do. And that's its only rules and it has no boundaries. <laughs> the reality is that 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 doesn't exist. And while that's a fun thought experiment, that doesn't mean we shouldn't use AI today to render our room more quickly because that's going to make some nice backgrounds for, for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, We're in the mode in some ways right now where we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater with things like facial recognition in some disciplines and environments. Not that we don't need to govern and put restrictions around it, but I still like to throw that caveat out there as as often as I can that there's still value and uses for these. Let's not sacrifice those up front just because we can imagine some doomsday scenario that was written up in a sci-fi book. Yeah, I agree. Let's talk about some of the, is now we've got all these technologies floating out though. Those technologies are coming from some major players mm-hmm. and some smaller players. Let's talk about some of the key players who are building the, the, the metaverse and metaverses today. Key, uh, key companies building the technologies and then 
where some of the startups and fun players are as well. The two, and I'll kick it off with this and see if you agree, the two I think that really are core to the furthest along in thinking about and implementing core technology and implementations of the metaverse are Meta and Microsoft. Yeah. So Meta has done a big, and they were insightful in acquiring Oculus and then building out a couple experience platforms and coming at it from the perspective that you're suggesting, which is that experience, that collaborative experience between us, which is what Meta and Facebook were designed for, is for us to connect and share information mm-hmm. and, and talk and communicate. That is one place where they've sort of gotten ahead. Microsoft, in true Microsoft fashion, has had some really interesting experiments in technology and is building some of the tool set and platforms that I think will be potentially enablers. In fact, there was just a news article this past week that more of what Meta is doing in terms of using cloud technology for advancing some of their experiments, especially in the area of AI and some of their research, is going to be happening on Azure and on Microsoft's cloud. Um, but Microsoft has HoloLens and Microsoft has Altspace VR, which is a VR environment, a, a meta environment that businesses have already implemented their own spaces in. So Microsoft has done some of these kinds of things. Would you put anyone else in that sort of top tier category? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's sort of a next tier down with the rest of them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little broader. I think there are, you know, so if you think about it in terms of platform companies, I think. Like, you know, the two that you mentioned, Meta and Microsoft, are are two really good ones. I would expand it and I would probably go, because we talked about that, you know, those are very, you know, Microsoft has mixed reality and then, which is sort of blended in with our augmented reality that you and I have talked about today. You know, Meta, who knows exactly where they're going, but a lot of that is heavy VR. Um, yep. You could look at Snapchat, Snapchat was super early in the augmented reality space. And I would argue that, you know, they may not be as vocal of tagging things or calling metaverse. And I'm not following Snapchat as closely to sort of know everything that they're doing. But, you know, I would go, they've got a platform that's sort of already there and they're doing things. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're, then, they were certainly high up there on my, on my next year. And I would look at like um, Google is in there too. Like they've got yep. their next evolution of glasses and what they're doing with the cloud platform. So, and I'll, and you know, it doesn't get a lot of sort of love in the Western world, but there's a ton of amazing things that like Alibaba is doing with Ali cloud, especially as you look at what's going on in sort of the rest of, you know, the rest of the world. So I, 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 metaverse I, I, commerce. I, I, they're, yeah. they're a leader actually in metaverse commerce. Yep. Exactly. A hundred percent. So I think every big, cloud platform is doing something yes. but then i so think aws that, and google the, and the, and the, the edges though of quick. what you talked in maybe edge is not the sort of right word to use there but the the tangential technologies that are there i think are players then that we don't think about but are right up doing all this stuff so like nvidia is a great example yeah like all the ai models trying to get them to run on smaller chips in silicon like just far and away an amazing company um yes. really a leader in in you know if you want to kind of in things that are related to metaverse um i agree and and enabling technology nvidia might be top in my mind besides yeah. just the core technology that we all use today like cloud computing yep um, and i think nvidia samsung engines, is probably the rendering yeah. engines oh samsung yep. samsung and then yeah, you know, I know that they're one. a little bit in their own reinvention at the moment, but I just have to imagine that. Um, and again, nothing that I know. I'm just speculating. Like, I just have to imagine Intel's doing, you know, trying to do something maybe in this space. But but again, I go at that from not the headset part of this, but they have a really rich camera history. So again, I go. We may not be hearing a lot of news on these, but if you think about some of the major players that have the components that have to come together for this, they're... And Intel they're, is good at that. Yep, Intel is, a, is good at the integrated yep. integrated circuits and integrated chips and in, putting putting the graphics on the die, putting yeah. the VR rendering on the die, putting the yep. AR on the die. And then yep. once it's there, being able to shove that into a tinier and tinier device and run yep. it on my watch or run it on a pair of glasses. And I mean, that would be great really, for Intel to get advanced in that. Yeah, space. and we haven't really been 
categorizing as we've been naming these companies, but you know, Unity right up there. Um, Unity and Unreal. Yep. In Unity terms of Unreal. enabling technologies. Yep. Um, Unreal Five. I'm a I'm a huge fan. I've done most of my AR VR work in Unity. Yep. But Unreal is doing some amazing things right now that can certainly help. Yeah. And then, I mean, look at just the NFT crypto side. You've got a ton, like, you know, maybe you go with the big ones like Coinbase, but there's a bunch of others um, that are sort yeah, of Yeah, I there. listed so, some out. I haven't played with too many of them, but Decentraland, <laughs> The Sandbox, yeah. CryptoVoxels, Somnium, Space. So, and those are the worlds, right? So you've got, yeah. so, you know, those maybe the way to think about this is you've got kind of core infrastructure. Yeah. You've got hardware, right? Because you've got a mix of like, you could go, well, Meta's doing some infrastructure, but at the same time, they also have hardware. Microsoft right. sort of has that same thing. You've got um, virtual worlds. You've got the economy side of things. Right. That, like Alibaba you know, and, and, and players that are there. there. And then just layer in the virtualization or the experience layer that sort of sits. I guess I was going this way. I should have gone on top. But like the, the experience <laughs> layer on, on, on top of that. And I, there's, yeah. then you could go, there's, there's major players actually in each of those. Um, as, and that's, I think where we all should be watching is yeah. what are the major players? Where are the experiments in each of those layers? And the most interesting things are going to be when people start taking things across those layers and combining them together. Yeah. A lot of them and, will combine together as you're suggesting at the experience level. That's where we're going to see it manifest into something being done in a better way. Yeah, and I think you see some of those experiments today. You've got brands that are trying lots of things. Yeah. Um, you've got retailers that are trying things. You've got banks, JP Morgan being a great one of like, we're just going to open a virtual branch and, you know, Decentraland. Um, I think those are all really good because you've got a bunch of companies that are exploring and trying to see and then you know, trying to further what they're doing from the brand side. I think there's less things that you see on the experiments on, we talked on some employee experience angles of this. Um, I think the one thing that gets downplayed a little bit, but I actually think is probably the biggest thing from an enterprise perspective is, you know, this broad term of like industrial metaverse. So sort of the, yeah. the notion of what you do from design of product and service through manufacturing and then to like B2B sales and the reinvention of that where some of that work is already happening today. Um, but you've got them in pockets and silos. Like maybe you've redone how you think about the collaboration on your product design um, and you're using different 3D modeling and techniques and you know, meeting spaces to bring people geographically and round tripping with the ultimate end customer to be involved in that design yeah. process in some real tactile ways. Yeah. But Same thing on the service end. Exactly. But the difference is those things are separate experiments. And what, yeah. what yeah. I believe is that the power is going to come on these string together end to end. Um, and then when that happens, you can begin to really go, we've got the notion of a different set of experiences from an industrial metaverse perspective, um, right. because you're 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 creating that value chain across. Whereas today, it's like, well, yeah, we have our digital twin of our manufacturing plant, and that's all well and good. It is a foundation. It is a building block. It's got to be done. But how does that connect to the design process? And how does that connect to the distribution and then eventually as you said sort of service side of things and that's where an right. organization needs to be thinking of how do i share the assets that we're creating across the organization right because again we get back to our what is central and control and can i use them in one place you have that same problem within an enterprise itself so you don't just have the i'm going to go do everything and i'm locked into a Microsoft metaverse virtual world experience or a meta one or somebody else's. But within an organization, you go, I'm in the, you know, uh, the whatever, whatever business group. And we did one thing and business yeah. group B has done something similar and they don't talk to each other. 
and they're recreating the same assets because they both are, you know, using the same thing, but they just have done it in their own way. And the value is going to be when that stuff can get elevated and really connected across. And there's probably an opportunity there for tools vendors and again, machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to be grabbing some of these assets and translating them between these different environments. Yeah. I've done work with digital twin assets, engineering assets that are done on CAD tools and bringing those into, I took, I took CAD designed assets that were part of the ventilator project that we worked mm. on. Yes, yes, yes. And CAD design assets and brought those into an augmented reality experience. Yep. There was a little bit of a pipeline, but there's a lot of tools that were able to bring those across and take those from those various environments and not have to redo the work in that case, which was great. One last class of contributors here, and this is relevant in all of these places, but especially Microsoft and what they're going through right now with a huge acquisition is the video game mm -hmm. environments and yep the video game companies that have been building virtual worlds of their oh, own for decades. Probably the furthest ahead of everybody. <laughs> so. And yes, and are probably sitting back here right now and hearing about Horizon Worlds and Altspace VR <laughs> and going, we've been doing that a hundred times better for 20 years. What, where is this now some, <laughs> you know, some new interesting thing? You know, my, our avatars are so much better rendered and you can be a wizard or you can be a person or you can be whatever you want to be or you can be a dragon and walk yeah. around. And Microsoft acquired or is in the process of acquiring. Hopefully that's, that's going to go through. But uh, EA, Activision Blizzard, uh, yep. Activism, Activision mm -hmm. Blizzard, uh, which has World of Warcraft and yeah. other kinds of virtual environments. What is your perspective on that? Uh, do you, you know, obviously they've been doing this kind of thing. Do you think that these game environments could sort of be the core or do you think their assets and tools and experience in building those environments is going to be brought into places like Allspace and, and Meta? Which direction do you think that might go and why do you think that these companies are starting to make these acquisitions? You know, I can't speak for whatever Microsoft's intent was behind the strategy that, you know, wanting to go forward with the acquisition. I, I think it's probably a blend of almost everything that you said. Um, you know, I think there's a continuation of just, you know, Microsoft does have a whole gaming unit, right? So yeah, there's just an there's element of bolstering what they're doing in gaming um, and getting key titles and, you know, expanding the platform that that they have so there's, there. there's probably roi even if they do nothing with the metaverse kind of concept in them just acquiring activision yeah. blizzard and then uh, i assume activision. activision blizzard has a bunch of ip that probably can be used and if microsoft is smart about it then they will see that stuff across you know other engineering teams and business groups and and the like and because it is as you said it's got the elements that that are sort of there um, Microsoft you right. know, also has had gaming studios in the past. Um, I think the thing that's most interesting to me, maybe not purely related to the acquisition, is to do this stuff is actually not just a standard developer. It's not like we're going to go build a website and now you need, a, you know, if you didn't care about the user experience, Here's two people. It'll take them a week and they can go pop out some code and go build this thing. Right. The step change, and I think that's really what's an interesting signal related to just what's happening with all the gaming studios and the companies are you need a vast set of varying skills that a stu like a gaming studio brings to create really compelling experiences um, that are here. And I think part of that is things that are not figured out yet in traditional kind of standard large corporate enterprises. Like there has been a yeah. move to, you know, different types of development models and studio models almost where you've got, you know, designers and data scientists and engineers that are sort of sitting together working on problems. You're now talking about adding a couple of other roles that are sort of in here. And I could, you know, again, I have no idea what Microsoft is doing, but like I could go, there may be some models that are in here that they go, how do we think about our development teams in a little bit different way? And I just go, Interesting. I don't know if they're doing that, but I go for 
our clients that we work with, that has to be things that, you know, they don't need to go start like today and go hiring a bunch of teams to go do things a little bit differently. But the evolution to really build the compelling types of metaverse experiences that are going to be here, there's going to be some ways that you're going to be able to short change and shortcut some of those with some of the AI things we talked about before. But in where you want to really lean in and do something custom and have a really rich environment and really use the notion of you know, spatial audio and some of these other pieces, you've got to have different, you're, you're almost kind of got a TV production, video game type studio to help really bring all this stuff to life and to manage acquire, it. If you're one of these, these platform creators going out there and acquiring the studio and acquiring yeah. that talent that can help you build that and help you learn those disciplines that you might not have the the muscle to flex today yeah. uh, to to understand and work that out and bolster yourself that way. I think that's really relevant and probably again if it's not front and center of why they acquired like Microsoft for example acquired Activision Blizzard is probably a, a potential asset. Yeah, that's that's a really good one. Yeah, and I mean will we see non-technology companies go do the same thing? Maybe I don't know. Right. Could be interesting. Let's in our last five minutes here, let's wrap it up by thinking about the end of 2022 into 2023 or even a three year, five year roadmap. What are a couple of your insights that you would suggest for us to do? What, what is it? So the, here's all this stuff that we're talking about and all these experiments in, in metaverse and related technologies. What should I maybe as a, as a person do? And maybe what should I as a business do? Let's let's talk about that for a second. So start wherever you want there. Yeah. I think as an individual, if you're interested and you're kind of in the tech design type of world, I think it's always worthwhile to be a little bit educated and you may not believe kind of in the notion of like NFTs and all this other stuff that's going on, but I I think the best thing to do is you know, try and learn and see what it is. And maybe you sign up for a wallet and you don't, you know, you spend $10 and you do something and you don't, you never touch it again for however long an attorney, but there's something that you learn by sort of doing. And I think that there is a consumer side of this. If you're kind of just in this area and in this space to pick a couple of things and make sure that you've tried them. If you've never done and worn a virtual reality headset and experienced that, I think it's a great thing for anybody to be able to um to do and to try um just so you have a sense of like what 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 it is you know when it comes to a business i go it totally depends to me on on your industry and you know what you're trying to do i i I go the same thing for the education side Um, if you're a brand i think you begin to sort of try and experiment in sort of various ways but you're not betting the farm on, on on this stuff today. I do think there is a bit of pressure at the executive level of, you know, so again, we've got a 20 year horizon that's sort of here, right? That I think you've got some people that were probably, you know, let's say earlier in their career that now may be in senior, more senior leadership positions at a lot of companies that go, I saw what happened when the internet was here in the beginning and like we decided we weren't going to create a website and we were like five years behind of what we needed to do there. And I think there's a little bit of hangover on, I don't want to miss this boat, whatever it is. And so there's a frenzy of like, we just going to experiment a lot. And I think there's goodness in that, but I also think it's choosing the right experiments. Um, Or I shouldn't say that because you don't always know what the right experiment is going to be. I think it's the, being okay that what you're doing now is not necessarily going to be what it makes sense for you to do in the next two or three years. Um, But that you're doing enough to help learn and educate and some things will be successful and some things are not. And that that's an okay thing. Um, And this is core innovation skill sets. Yeah. I think think the biggest thing is, you know, you mentioned it on sort of that ventilator project uh, that you were sort of working on and taking a CAD design and trying to bring that into some augmented reality world. For sure, 3D assets are not going anywhere. 
that is the core and the crux of how to do a lot of all of these different experiences. And some of it may be non-sexy things where you just go, we've got all of our clothing items and they are all in 2D things that we do on our website. How do you begin to actually take what you may have already as a CAD design of those in 3D, but they're just not ready to be used in assets kind of in this metaverse technology and the beginning to do those building blocks of just let's make sure when we're doing this, we've got all the pieces and components that are there. So right. if somebody stands up some store or something, we've got the interoperability there to be able to, you know, to, to play or we want to do that for our own environment that we're standing up. I think there's a massive amount of attention that's not being given to the building block layers of some of this. And to me, one of those is 3D and 3D asset management um, and how that really gets managed across an enterprise. Um, again, yes. not super sexy, exciting things, not things that probably a bunch of people are going to go spend money on to go do. But it's it's foundational because, as you said, it takes a lot of time and space to create these things. Um, and there's ways to do it faster and doing synthetic data to, you know, to help make right. some of that. Um, but it's just doing the planning and then yeah. knowing when you want to execute against, you know, those create things the right. organizational function over time, yep. start, start yep. to think about that, start to create the partnerships that are going to allow you to do it and start yep. to experiment and find the tool sets. Yeah. Because as you said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of digitization at the CAD and manufacturing level 100%. of everything these days. Yep. So there is a pipeline and a path from mm -hmm. going from CAD designs to renderable assets. Yeah. It's not just one 3D asset, though, on the other end. There's different resolutions and renderings and, and number of polygons for different platforms yeah. that need to be created. So understanding and starting to build that function to be able to create those, even if you don't create all of them right away, that's, exactly. a, that's a great uh, advice for businesses. And a lot of, if you want case studies of how this works today, a lot of businesses are quite far ahead. Mm -hmm. I know uh, IKEA, 100% of their assets yeah. are both in CAD and in very renderable 3D yep. viewable objects, both for 3D spaces and their entire catalog, their, their paper catalog, which they're probably going to stop printing very soon anyway. <laughs> but their entire catalog, every, every time you see an IKEA kitchen, it's 100% 3D rendered assets. It looks yeah. like a photo. It's not a photo. So they're already there. Look and experiment and find out what those kinds of companies are doing and use, use that as your example for at least the functions that you should be thinking about as a business. Yeah. And then, yeah, I, I like your idea, your advice for consumers. It's very natural for someone like you and I to go off and experiment and try these things. The last couple of years, though, have, as you said, accelerated everyone in needing to try out a bunch of digital experiences that, yep. that they might not have in the past. So continue to do that. Use that freedom that you felt to and need and forcing function to go off and try some of those things and try some also in sort of this metaverse adjacent technology area. And I think you'll have a lot of fun along the way in addition yeah. to being ready to jump in and get value out of it as just a person when the yep. time comes as well. Agreed. All right, Aaron, this has been an amazing conversation. Yeah. I certainly always have a lot of fun talking to you. We've been working together for Thanks. quite a number of years. Anything innovation related is fun both to speculate on and then to see what's real today. I think there is plenty of things that are real that we've talked about. And I think there's plenty of, this is a great one to watch as it evolves because it's very, very early and it could go lots of directions. Yep. So We'll have to get back together on this topic. I know we've got a bunch of other topics that we could also talk about, but we'll have to circle back on this one probably at least once every six months and just see where things are at and where it's going. This will be a fun one that I think is going to evolve quickly from year to year at this point. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you again. Appreciate being here and you know, always enjoy talking with you, Jeff. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care. This has been a Nexavise production. For video, links, and to support the show, please visit nexavise.com. That's N-E-X-A-V-I-S-E dot -E com.